So if you're like me, you might have heard this phrase being thrown around in the media or even by your relatives. Aya, the homosexuals all learn about it from Western TV lah. You see that movie, what's it called? Broke Bang Mountain, win Oscar. Of course it influenced young people ma. Well it's no wonder I grew up afraid to even ask questions surrounding homosexuality. Was I really influenced by the things I saw on TV? Come to think of it, I thought there was a censorship department in charge of erasing these negative influences in my life. So, I did a bit of digging and found out that in Singapore 2007, there was actually a review on the Penal Code that petitioned to repeat Section 377A. Penal Code 377A is the legislation used to criminalize the act of homosexuality in countries like Singapore and Malaysia. So this review in Singapore was met with a fierce opposition, labeling themselves as pro-family activists. As a statement in this advocacy, Singaporean MP Theo Lee An said on the repeal, if we seek to copy the sexual liberty and ethos of the wild, wild west, then repeating section 377A is progressive. But that is not our final destination. We have no need of foreign or neo-colonial moral imperialism in matters of fundamental morality. Well, the idea of homosexuality or any kind of LGBTQ plus identity originates from the West is the rhetoric peddled by most anti-LGBTQ plus activists in these regions. Even the term pro-family, which have been used to shun and shame homosexuality, was an attempt to reject Western individualism. Well, the framing of homosexuality as anti-family served more than just the perception that homosexuality was immoral. Ultimately, it sought to establish that homosexuality was fundamentally un-Asian. But, nothing more could be further from the truth. With the help of The Twain Have Met, a Singaporean voice for politics, current affairs, social issues, and everything in between on Instagram, I will endeavor to show you that homosexuality and other LGBTQ plus inclinations, identities, and orientations are, contrary to some beliefs, have always been historically prevalent in our society. And no matter how you look at it, it's essentially Asia-born and Asia-bred right through the ages. Hey, it's me, Adam T. If you're interested in watching stories about being part of an Asian LGBTQ plus community, I make videos and vlogs on this channel about my life as a first gen migrant who escaped the dangers of homophobia in my country. <laughs> if that interests you, do consider subscribing. And before we begin, could you please tap the like button and let's get on our way. Topic one, homosexuality in ancient China. I'm going to first talk about China, as Chinese history actually backdates most European history as we know it. The earliest records of homosexuality in China actually dated back to the Shang Dynasty, approximately 1600 to 1100 BCE. Official Chinese historical records also indicated that homosexuality was neither considered a crime nor immoral and was acceptable amongst the broad upper class members of society. A few examples of this prominence includes the emperor's male lovers. During the Western Han era, there were 11 emperors, 10 of whom had at least one homosexual lover. The Ming Dynasty same-sex marriages. During the Ming Dynasty, it was common for men of all social classes in the Fujian province to have male lovers. The older man would be considered qi xiong, which meant adoptive older brother, and the young one, the qi di, adoptive younger brother. These men sometimes had quasi-marriages, where they swore eternal loyalty to one another. After this, the Qi Di would move into the Qi Xiong's household. There, he would be treated as a son-in-law by his husband's parents, and the older husband would be responsible for the other's care. The Golden Orchid Association. The Golden Orchid Association in Guangdong provided a sisterhood alternative for women who did not want to get married to men. While these marriages were not always romantic or sexual, it was common for women to be romantically and or sexually attracted to each other. The difficulties of persuasion tells the story of a king in the state a Wei named Ling, who was in love with a handsome man named Mi Xu Xia. While taking a walk in the king's garden, Mi picked an unusually sweet and delicious peach. Instead of eating the peach whole, Mi saved the remaining half for the king. The king was so touched by Mi's affection that he publicly acknowledged his love and Mi's position as his lover, giving rise to the expression sharing the remaining peach, which in Chinese is Yu Tao or Fen Tao as 
a term for homosexuality. Another one is the history of a former Han. It tells the story of an emperor who was in love with a young man named Dong Xian. He was so fascinated by his beauty that he appointed him a high position in court. Dong accompanied the emperor on all his travels and always slept with him in the same bed. Once, when the two were taking a nap, the emperor woke up and saw that the long sleeve of his clothes was trapped under Dong. Instead of waking him up and disturbing his lover's rest, the emperor decided to cut his sleeve off. Thus, the cut sleeve Duan Xiu Zhi Pi, became a literary expression for same-sex love. Topic 2. Queer definitions throughout Asia. As big and historical as China is, if that hasn't convinced you enough, let's get closer to the regions of Southeast Asia. So I'll categorize them by countries. Indonesia, Gumblak, widely recognized as the Javanese Kama Sutra, Surat Jantini, details sex between men, or Gumblak, in Pomorogo, and the existence of Warok, they're butch gay men, and Jatil, effeminate gay men, in the East Javanese town. Though homosexuality was by no means described as a widespread practice, it was neither seen as an offense nor a threat to society. The Bisu, Jalabai, and Jalalai. The Bugis people of South Sulawesi recognized five genders. Makunrai, which is a cisgender female. Orane, which is a cisgender male. Bisu, which is non-binary. Chalabai, which is the transgender male. And Chalalai, which is the transgender female. The Bisu were actually seen to both encompass and transcend all other gender types and were actually highly respected in their communities. You'll find that this respect for the non-binary is actually a common theme throughout the region. Another one from Indonesia is the Waria. Waria are often described as women's soul in a man's body, a concept where aspects of both gender coexist. The term itself is a combination of two Indonesian words, with women being wanita and man being pria, hence Waria. In modern day, some Warias do undergo full sexual reassignment surgery in transitioning from male to female. And there are others that retain their male bodies but express or identify as female. Now onto the region of Borneo, Manang Bali. The Manang Bali were typically male-bodied shamans who adopted feminine dress and demeanor and took men as their husband. They were respected by the Iban indigenous community on the large island of Borneo, held roles of great ritual importance and were typically wealthy village chiefs known for their knowledge in the healing arts. Onto the Malay Peninsula, Sida Sida. The Sida Sida were priests who served in the palace of the Malay sultans that held the responsibility for safeguarding women in the palace as well as the food and clothing of royalty. They were known to undertake androgynous behaviors such as wearing women's clothing and doing, traditionally known, women's tasks. The Philippines, Bakla. Bakla denotes the Filipino practice of male cross-dressing, denoting a man that has feminine mannerisms, dresses as a woman, or identifies as a woman. It is an identity built on performative cultural practices more so than sexuality. Often considered a Filipino third gender, what most people don't get is that the Bakla can either be homosexual or heterosexual. They were known to be community leaders, rulers who transcended the duality between men and women. And we can't forget India, Hidras. Similar to the Filipino Bakla, a Hidra is a person of a third gender community. Hidras include people assigned male at birth who may or may not undergo castration and modifications such as breast implants, as well as some, but not all, intersex people and transgender women. Hidras typically dress in women's clothing, wear makeup, and take feminine names. So since you've watched through this, you know that many Asian countries have had some form of LGBTQ plus representation in their history and culture now. But many now who reject the ideology of homosexuality actually shared one common influence, colonialism. For countries like India, Singapore, and Malaysia, it was actually British colonialism that pushed the concepts of homophobia through its laws. The most prominent one being Penal Code 377A. This is actually a law that has affected everything about my life and how it made me find this pathway to migrating into Australia. Heck, being part of the British colonies, even Australia once proclaimed this law. But fortunately for me, it was all repealed by 1997. All right, so let's get into the origin story of this law. When Sir Shenton Thomas discovered that two high-ranking European men who were deployed in Singapore were caught in brothels with male Asian prostitutes, Sir Thomas, you know, I don't even feel good calling him Sir, but Whatever, this is the story. So Thomas, as government of the Straits Settlement at the time, was livid. Not primarily because of the immorality of homosexuality or prostitution, 
No, this was a huge problem because white European men were the ones fraternizing with these male Asian prostitutes. Why was this such a huge problem? First, homosexuality was seen through British eyes as unnatural, immoral, and most relevant, uncivilized. These European white man's burden dictated that the white man has a responsibility to tame the savage native. How could he do that if he himself was engaging in this incivility? The justification for colonial pursuit lay in a belief of the superiority of, as we still deal with it to some degree today, white manhood. The possibility of sexual encounters between white man and Asian natives had the potential to destabilize the legitimacy of the colonial venture itself. By breaking the myth of white masculinity, as homosexuality was seen as feminine, and by calling to question the white man's belief in their supposedly innate characteristic of authority, sexual propriety, and independence. These two reasons effectively served as legitimacy for the implementation of Section 377A. Homosexuality was seen as a temptation, one that would seduce the colonizer to the ways of the native. As George Raddick writes in Decolonizing Singapore's Sex Laws, tracing section 377A of the Penal Code. The need to modernize the colonial while staving off temptation for the colonizer therefore served as a plausible reason for the implementation of section 377A in the Strait Settlements. Now, it's important to note that before colonization, homosexuality was never regarded as despicably immoral. One of the two men caught with male prostitutes wrote in defense for his actions in Singapore, this vice of homosexuality is peculiarly prevalent amongst both Europeans and Asiatics. Moreover, it is not regarded with the same disapproval accorded to it in Western countries, because the Asiatic regards this vice as no less natural than womanizing and conveying no greater stigma. So Thomas, um, or Sir Thomas, discovers that there is existing British law with which to charge these two men with, section 377, which prevents carnal intercourse against the order of nature. However, this would only be effective when intercourse was proven, which was terribly difficult to do in 1938. Thus, Sir Thomas decides to paraphrase from the Le Boucherie Amendment of 1885 and create Section 377A, which would criminalize private and public homosexual acts. And, as we know it, this law is still in place today. Okay, pretty long-winded video, so Thank you for sticking through to the end. I'm gonna finish off this video with a thought for you. By this logic, if homosexuality isn't a Western import, what is? Well, it's homophobia. If you enjoyed this video, please support this channel by hitting the like button and maybe consider subscribing to this channel for more stories of my life as an Australian migrant who's being persecuted by the Western import of homophobia. Now, the irony of subscribing is that I now live in a Western civilization. <laughs> Unfortunate as it may seem, I've also found a way to look into the positive side of life. Although the way my life has turned out is a product of this law, I do hope to continue this conversation and one day see it banished from our societies. And until next time, 